My name is Russell Hittinger. I'm executive director of the Institute for Human Ecology here at Catholic U. Uh, IHE is committed to identifying the conditions conducive to human flourishing and to do so in an interdisciplinary perspective, bringing faculty from across the country, the world, and within Catholic University itself to think about important questions that pertain to all of us. One of our longest standing partnerships is with Ross Douthat, who of course writes as a columnist for the New York Times and is a media fellow here with IHE. I like to think of Ross as the last Renaissance mind of the New York Times editorial page. And by the way, this is a paradox that doesn't need to be resolved. We've enjoyed Ross's friendship and collaboration for a number of years, and we're honored to have these conversations together. So welcome back, Ross. It's a pleasure. Uh, tonight's panel uh, promises to be quite intriguing. Ross will introduce the panelists and will moderate the discussion. We will have uh, time for questions from the audience at the appropriate moment, and we invite you to join us for a reception afterwards. Let's get going. All right, let's do it. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, congratulations on your ascent to absolute power at the Institute for Human Ecology, to whom I'm incredibly grateful for having the opportunity to organize panel discussions like these. Have I really been doing it for how long did you say? Seven years? No, hasn't been seven years. Six years. That's, that, that sounds more reasonable. Um, and we've covered a lot of ground in those discussions. Um, you know, we once had Saurabh Amari and David French arm wrestling on this, on this very stage. We've covered well, that that will come you and I yeah we'll we'll get we'll get to that we'll get to that later uh we've covered national politics uh catholic theology church politics um but this promises to be the most experimental maybe event that I've that I've moderated because we're going to be talking about the weird future of american religion uh and a discussion with a title like that promises to itself be relatively weird uh, and hopefully we'll live up we'll live up to that advertisement but we're going to be talking basically about the landscape of American spirituality in a world where institutional Christianity is in decline um, but secularism and sort of a purist a pure zealous atheism are perhaps not the dominant forces in society certainly not to the extent that was anticipated at the time when Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett and the other new atheists were supposedly paid to religion and spirituality once and for all. Um, instead, I think the landscape is much stranger than that, much more complicated than that. Uh, there's a lot of religious and spiritual energy obviously channeled into politics, but there's a lot of religious and spiritual energy channeled into um literal religious and spiritual practices that range from attempts at the recovery of various forms of paganism um, to experiments with sort of psychedelic frontiers and spiritual experience to, and we can get into this a bit, but I think there's clearly a religious dimension to some of the fascination with both UFOs and artificial intelligence at the moment. Um, so those are some of the subjects that we may touch on tonight. And joining me for this intriguing conversation um, in the center of our panel is Tara Isabella Burton, uh, with whom I've had the privilege to share a stage before talking about this topic at the American Enterprise Institute a few years ago. But I think she and I both agreed beforehand that things have gotten even weirder since that. Um, and she is a uh, I suppose you could say social critic and novelist, an actual Renaissance lady um, in the best, the best sense of the word. Uh, the book that we'll be talking most about tonight is a book called Strange Rights that's an attempt to sort of chart 
this new sort of self-fashioned religious landscape. But her most recent book is Self-Made, a sort of study of the creation of personal identity and self-making from from where to the Kardashians? Uh, da Vinci. From Da Vinci to the Kardashians, right. Um, and then her novels include The World Cannot Give, Social Creature, and forthcoming soon, a novel called Here in Avalon, uh, that, as the title suggests, promises to touch on the borderlands of fairy itself. And then to her left is Susanna Black Roberts, who is a senior editor at Plow and Mere Orthodoxy. She's the co-author or co-editor and co-editor with Ann Snyder of Breaking Ground, Charting Our Future in a Pandemic Year. Um, and she's a frequent participant, participant in internet controversies over the new paganism, its philo philosophical implications and other subjects that we will try to touch on. And then finally, immediately to my left, is Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, who is an exorcist, not the chief exorcist, a mere exorcist for the Archdiocese of Washington. Uh, he is a professor here at CUA, and I learned, I should have known this, but I just learned that he is the chaplain for the Washington Nationals, um, which, you know, is not weird, it's just cool. Um, but we're going to let him go last, and we're going to start with Tara. Um, and I was hoping that based on your book and your sort of perspective in essays and observations and so on, you could give us a sort of lay of the land of what you see as sort of the different modules or modes of spiritual exploration that are important to understand in a sort of de-Christianizing landscape. Sure. Uh, well, it, let's start with it is indeed uh, weird. Um, then the way that I would frame it is is something like this. I think that um, there is perhaps less now than there was uh, when I wrote Strange, Strange Rights, uh, but there is a sense that we are in a, a so-called secular age, that uh, you know, religious affiliation is down, uh, interest in and trust in uh, all kinds of institutions, ecclesiastical, political, journalistic, uh, are down and something is happening. And new, sort of by the numbers, about a quarter of Americans are now religiously unaffiliated. Uh, they're they're part of the religious N-O-N-E, nuns. Uh, always have to clarify that when saying it out loud. Uh, and about 36% of uh, young millennials and members of Generation Z uh, are also unaffiliated. So this is a generational phenomenon. And there there is sort of, I think, one way of looking at it, which is saying, Religion is in decline, and and you know we're all we're all headed towards the the new atheist future, but um, I don't think that's true. And purely looking at um, some of the numbers, some of the self-reported uh, data about this, about uh, seventy-two percent of self-reported uh, religious nuns say they do believe in a higher power. About 20% uh, of them say, and I believe this is how the polling question words it, they believe in the, the God of the Bible. Um, so, so something clearly a little bit more interesting uh, than, and weird than, than straightforward secularism is going on. And uh, in, in Strange Rights, I, I investigated some of the various phenomena uh, that I think a kind of eclectic spiritual hunger is is manifesting as it were itself in 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 the America at least and um i think there's sort of a few different things going on and one is to say people are are finding the the tenets or the the building blocks of religious life in uh, more eclectic ways in strange rights i call this remixing religion the idea that you can get your your ritual from place A and your sense of meaning from place B and your sense of community from place C and you can mix and match and a little bit of yoga here and a little bit of sage cleansing there and you know show up still show up to, to church for Christmas Eve and what have you. And I think that's that's sort of one element of the religious landscape now. Uh, but in the course of writing Strange Rights and since, and particularly since the pandemic, I think I, I'd want to make an even more robust claim than that, which is that the very 
kind of metaphysical and moral architecture underpinning the assumptions that religion is something that you can remix, that uh, the purpose of the religious life or one's religious identity or self-assertion is to um, kind of custom and curate something that fits one's own internal psychological sense of well-being, uh, that that actually is a it's a pretty robust assumption, and I think a, a relatively uh, widespread one. And um, these various sort of individual discrete phenomena, be they a rise of interest in the occult, in witchcraft, there was a sort of post-2016 rise of the witch aesthetic as a political statement that was also kind of spiritual, whether we're talking about wellness culture, whether we're talking about fandom, whether we're talking about kind of any one of a number of, of discrete ways that people are looking for meaning and community and, and purpose and ritual, all of them, in my view, do uh, ultimately boil down to, or at least uh, can be understood under the umbrella of a kind of obsession with, with turning inwards and with connecting one's own internal psychological state to a kind of nebulous energy out there in the universe. And I think that, you know, you see this in a lot of uh, colloquial language about, you know, good energy, bad energy, toxic energy. You see this in the rise of phenomena like the new thought, post new thought, post law of attraction, uh, idea of manifesting, uh, the idea that if you can just sort of will yourself into imagine yourself being wealthy or healthy or what have you it will come to you according to one poll at least at least 50 percent of americans say they believe it works and about 20 odd say uh report having practiced it um and i think this idea that somehow the way to get in touch with whatever is out there in the universe is to look inwards and that our psychological and affective states can somehow connect us to what is true out there to me is uh, underpins a lot of what I see as the contemporary American religious landscape. And particularly post pandemic, as we've all gotten more online and we all have, or many, perhaps most of us have plugged into a world where um, our desires and our internal psychological states can sort of change what we see, can change the geography of our daily experience uh, in a way that is not possible in the material world, I think that is only intensified. But we can talk more about the internet later. So that's where I'm at. So Susanna, I mean, some people, maybe myself included, have, you know, in the remarks I just offered, have described some of this as a repaganization, right? That's sort of the idea of religion as primarily an imminent rather than transcendent force, right? That, the, you know, the idea of sort of the self connecting to energies and or connected, connecting to beings that are sort of not the Judeo-Christian God, but some, you know, sort of powers is sort of part, part of this. Um, and you've written a fair amount about paganism as a philosophy, Right. And those of us who write about politics are, you know, now constantly assailed by discussions of figures like Bronze Age pervert, right? And sort of internet vitalism, the return of Nietzsche, all of these things. But can you talk about sort of the, the philosophical implications of a kind of pagan turn in American life, if there is one? <laughs> I, I think, unfortunately, there is one. Um, so you've been talking for a long time about if, you know, if you don't like the Christian right, wait till you meet the post-Christian right. And the figure who, as you said, most kind of um, <laughs> pointedly embodies the post-Christian right at the moment, sort of, is Bronze Age Pervert, who many of you may know. And um, I don't know, you should probably check him out. Um, as a, I mean, not just, it's good to know these things. Um, and I guess the question that I have for myself in asking about like what does what is the relationship of this post-christian right to religion like is this a post-christian re religious right in a way um i think that's a kind of a, a complicated question i mean there are obviously several groups of wolves of vinland out there um doing kind of pagan right-wing norse nazi stuff um bap and the kind of um the primary energy, I think, on the post-Christian right is a little bit less 
religious than that in a way, but it is much more linked to something that you might call new thought. So this is a kind of a, it's it's weird to think um, in the, in these ways, but I think actually you might make a good case for Nietzsche being something like um, a dandy, something like a 19th century um, a advocate of a right-wing version of you know, getting in touch with your inner self or getting in touch with your, the, the, you know, in, in his psychology, he talks about the, the way that we need to identify with the tyrant essentially in our own selves, as opposed to identifying with the, the slave in our own selves. And this is actually something that's not that different than like kind of law of attraction stuff. It's just kind of like right wing law of attraction. Um, so when, Bap talks about you know the, the standard of the good being life, being Zoe. That ki- that Zoe that he's looking for is a kind of, it's very vibesy. It's very kind of like 19th century New Thoughty. It's not totally distant from Gwyneth Paltrow. It's just a kind of bro-ish version. Um, and I think the political implications of this, obviously, you know, there there are a lot of political implications of this. One of them is that. Um, this is going to be this is going to net out in into a politics that focuses on justice being the good of the stronger because if life is the standard then anything that is good for the weak is going to be uh, is going to be against good um so justice is going to be essentially the Calaclean justice or the justice that um uh wants to propose um and i think that what we're finding i guess one of the things that I, I think is happening on the post-Christian right, which actually is weirdly um, leaking into the Christian right with the, the no enemies to the right philosophy that I think is going around a lot in, in the Christian right, is the sense of um, a kind of, it's not just that it's not ethical monotheism, it's not ethical at all. It's post-good. It's not just post-Christian. Um, what it's not post is light. So the standard, again, is going to be life in the way that the standard of um, a left-wing version of this might be um, self-actualization. These are, these are ideas that are actually very similar. It's just that they're very differently flavored. You might call them more feminine, more masculine. Um, but trying to figure out what the, where the actual, um, where the origins of those ideas are uh, I think is fascinating. And I think that seeing Nietzsche as one of these figures who is essentially one of the the 19th century um, vitalist uh, new thought sorts of people is, is one way that it's helpful to uh, begin to figure that out. And when, when we were talking bef- beforehand, we had a suitably weird conversation to the local Starbucks. Um, <laughs> and you said, some, you said something like, you know, the problem with Nietzsche was that, you know, he wanted to recover the pagan gods, but he didn't actually believe in them, right? Yeah. But they believed in him. Yeah. Um, and that brings us to the subject of, well, demons, right? Since this is a, a Christian and Catholic context and a Christian and Catholic discussion of the spiritual landscape. Um, and Monsignor, I'm, I'm not just as I said beforehand, you're not just here to talk about demons. You're here to talk about anything you want. But um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how your own work informs your understanding of what a post-Christian spiritual landscape looks like, especially on its darker edges. Uh, sure. The, I've been an exorcist about 17, 18, 19 years. And first 12 years was very quiet. No and that was good. It was very quiet ministry. We had plenty of cases, but it was always kind of under the radar. And uh, and then all of a sudden we became the flavor of the month. I mean, it, it's like uh, everyone's into it, you know, and I get all these requests for podcasts and uh, news. And so I kind of like I'm buried with, with this public interest. And, yes, that's what they, well, I'll see you away, so I'll do it, of course. But, uh, but so all of a sudden we become kind of really interesting to people and they're really interested. I got a call from, I think a young woman or a guy from, where was from New York a few months ago and the person said, my faith is kind of wavering and I want you to prove to me that there are demons. And, and that sort of thing, I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what. So I did a Zoom call with a person and I showed him some photos that I have, which are quite striking and uh, which I don't 
if not for public, but I said, you can look at them. And he said, okay. So he got it. Uh, so I think, the, I think people today, they don't accept what their parents or the grandparents taught them about religion, and, but they wanted to find something from themselves. They want something that they can experience. And demons are something people say, oh, okay, I can, I can experience that. I can, there's something about that, which I don't have to worry about the, these guys in white, these guys in pointy hats and all these old white males, you know. But, but there is something that actually, you know, it's, it's really real. Like you can grab onto an experience, you know. So I think that's one of the reasons why the subject is so interesting to people, because something really does happen. And uh, that's striking to people. Uh, but there's a downside to it. And, uh, and people don't realize it. Uh, and so one of my missions is to, is to warn people. Uh, I, got a, I was telling Ross that I got an email from a woman yesterday morning, and she said during the pandemic that she got into witchcraft. She got into witchcraft. She went online and, and did these curses and stuff and consulted mediums and did all that kind of, you know, your call stuff. And she did it all, you know. And she said, uh, of course, then, not surprisingly, quote, all hell broke loose. I mean, there are things flying around the room that are smashing and just all that, like a bad movie. It's like a bad movie. And it does happen, by the way. So uh, like a bad movie. And then she couldn't stand going to church. She felt this nausea. She felt enraged and all this sort of demonic stuff. And it's it it really bad. She realized that she did something wrong. So she went to confession. She went to mass and stopped doing all those things. And she started going to our online session. We had these month, months a month online deliverance sessions. And we had one last night, night before last week, 15,000 people sign up. And uh, she said, I'm getting better. I've been doing these sessions for a year now every month, and I'm getting a lot better. She's like, it's tolerate going to church now. And all the, the stuff in the room wasn't flying around and crashing. I don't feel as nauseous about religious things. And she said, I passed this black thread through one of my, one of, one of her, or through her intestines, that would, so you, when, when a witch's curse is lifted, uh, oftentimes there will be a passing of what we call a bolus, uh, so, so the witch's uh, it's this dark uh, energy thing. And, and she, it was embarrassing, of course, but, but she passed and she's much better. So, so all I can say is, I mean, I, I, we get the people. I mean, we get the people who decide to go into, one woman went to Tibetan Buddhism and we're still praying over her, you know, and uh, she was cursed uh, and a lot of other different things. So... Uh, all I can say is when you go down that path, that, uh, you know, is there, there are consequences uh, to doing these things. And I would say this is the difference. We had a, a conference today. We have a monthly online confidential conference with exorcists around the country. We had 30, we had 40, actually we had 40 guys today. And we had a guy who had been in the, in the occult for 27 years. He wrote a book. I mean, it's not, it's not a secret. He it, wrote a book on Ross Miller, Satan's Trap. And he said, what's the difference between Christianity, he said, and, and, and the occult and all that stuff. In Christianity, you discern, you, you, you do God's will. If you listen to the words of the saints, they'll always say, I'm trying to do God's will. It, it, that's, that's just it's fundamental. That's what we as Christians try to discern and do God's will. In, in the occult and witchcraft, he said, what, what we did was we tried to create our own future. I want this, I want that. I'll throw a curse for this, I'll do a spell for that, and I'm going to take control over my, my life. And it's a completely different approach. And I would say that the latter is, is it, frankly, is Satan's approach. It's, if there's no God, you do it yourself. So, there you go. To, to what extent, so just in that, that shift in the last five or seven years, right, to what extent do you attribute that? Like you framed it as interest in your work. Has has gone up, right? Oh, totally. And does but does that seem like primarily just a sort of secondary consequence of more people being interested in the occult? Are you sort of downstream of these trends, or is there sort of like the first the first example you cited a kind of fascination with your work specifically from people who aren't you know who aren't themselves worried about their own oppression or possession, but are just interested in the tangibility. Uh, I think it's all those things. I think it's what, what you were talking about. I think you got, I think you nailed it. I mean, people are, in some ways, it's not bad. I mean, I, I did respond to this young person in New York because, no, she was really interested and was searching. Uh, so you're, there is a way in which there's searching 
And this gives them something to ground with because when, when you know there really are demons, for example, when someone, I told the Cardinal, I said, when someone finishes our program and, and it gets liberated, they're in the front pews of the church. Because they found out, by the way, that, that what the church teaches is true. There is God and there's demons. And, and, and the only way to get rid of them is Jesus, by the way. You know, yeah, so it, you learn the truth uh, the hard way. So I think a lot of people, rather than taking these truths that we were taught on faith, I, w- I want to figure it out for myself, which is not, not necessarily bad, but it is being done in a post-Christian way, which can be dangerous. And uh, we're, we're, we have more people, about people screaming they want us to pray over them, but we can't do it all. Um, it's, it's funny listening to both of you talk. Uh, I think that there is something so distinctly uh, 19th century about our, our present moment, perhaps uh, precisely in this kind of tension between uh, an interest in the perhaps spiritual or magical, we can give it different names, uh, power of the will uh, and its role in this kind of wider question of uh, what does it mean to live a life in a world that may or may not be enchanted and the hunger for that world to be enchanted. Um, Just uh, right before coming up here, I was talking to a friend of mine in the audience about uh, a novel that I I like very much uh, that I I wrote my doctoral thesis on in part, which is uh, Juris Carl Hismol's La Va. Uh, 1891, this story of uh, late 19th century Parisian kind of, you could basically call them hipster intellectuals, uh, who get involved in uh, Satan worship at the time. And what's so interesting to me about that novel, and I think very uh, timely, uh, very worth rereading, is precisely that the people who get involved in Satanism in the novel, they're not... um, a priori interested in Satan, they're bored, upper middle class intellectuals who find the kind of alienation and uh, sense of, of, of loss and boredom of 19th century Paris, which at the time is the sort of, you know, urban center, this era of mechanical reproduction and everything is is reproducible and everything feels fake. And what could, you know, at least maybe in calling down Satan, uh, there is some kind of escape from bourgeois modernity. Uh, and indeed, the uh, the characters at one point, there's this really affecting scene where they're they're at the satanic mass and they're, they're you know, the characters thinking, you know, at least in the good old days of the medieval era, they were committing human sacrifice and here it's just a a bunch of people having a party and it's meaningless and that is this occasion of a lot of despair which is all to say this very long plot summary that I think that there is some kind of that similar tension happening now that that I think we might be able to characterize uh interest in in the occult and more broadly in these uh spiritual forces uh beyond institutional religion as being indicative of a real and and often you know incredibly genuine hunger for something tangible, for something real, for something enchanted, without necessarily a, a systematic sense of what the implications, metaphysical or moral, might be. By which I you know I, I don't I might say uh, without speaking necessarily from a Catholic perspective to say that. Often, I think someone who's interested in in you know wellness or sage cleansing that often because it is presented as a well you know you can pick and choose this or you can kind of make this work for you there is less of an emphasis than there might be in a traditional lowercase o orthodox uh, religious setting about well how does this all fit together you know what are your views about energy what is out there in the divine how does that relate to your sense of of what ethics ought to be in your relationship to your neighbor and your relationship to the body and to the self. You know, what is the system underpinning this? And often uh, there is no system. And uh, to be colloquial, like it is kind of all just vibes. And um, I I think that it is precisely in uh, our 
and what I see as an increasing collective uh, discomfort with systemization and an increased interest in the kind of affective nature of the mix and match approach that you do kind of find yourself um, spiritually at sea, uh, whether or not demonic possession is evol evolved or just a kind of spiritual disorder, perhaps. What, what kind of landscape do you think, promising maybe is not the right word, but would you rather be a Christian in a landscape populated primarily by hard Darwinian materialists or a landscape populated by people sort of somewhere in the range from Gwyneth Paltrow's style woo to full occult fascination? And this is this is something that I wonder about too. Having you know, I've been doing, I've been writing as you know a representative of Catholic Christianity in the pages of the New York Times for a long time now, and I've seen, I think, a real shift in like who who am I writing for, right? Like, what is the the quote unquote secular audience? And you, I mean, Tara, you wrote a piece for the New Atlantis, right, about like just in Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley is sort of the center of rationalism and uh, you know sort of we're all just computers and we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna go with that and you wrote about sort of the you know the the revival of magic and woo right in silicon valley and sometimes that shift can make you feel vindicated as a christian it's like yeah you're, you know you're you're darn right there's spiritual realities and it's about time people woke up to them but then you read about like you know some of these sort of cultish you know, even before you get to sort of like in, in Silicon Valley, you'll have people who will talk about demons now, not as a sort of explicit, you know, these are these are supernatural entities, but as like a, a sort of shorthand for things they're trying to do with their own minds and they don't have another word for it. So they say, oh, you know, they call it a demon. And it is it's it's creepy in a way that's distinct even from the sort of frank creepiness of exorcisms and i so i sort of waver back and forth about which landscape yeah which which landscape the the christian should want to be in period before you start to get to like what do you say as a christian into that landscape i'm curious what you guys think of that question that was really long um yeah i i think that's a really good question and i i'm not i think i'd probably choose the woo world um just because hard materialist Darwinism seems so bleak to me. Um, on the other hand, being in woo world without the protection of Jesus seems really terrifying. So um, I don't know. I, I think that one other sort of way that w what you're asking kind of is getting at, one other thing what you're asking is getting at is the distinction between, so we're like, we've been talking about two different kind of motivations for getting involved in w weird stuff. Um, and one you might call the kind of um, self-actualization, um, self-transcendence, self-creation, uh, get taking charge of your own life um, approach, which can be quite scientific and quite sort of like life hacky. And, and I think that like the scientific and life hacky approach um, which, you know, at its farthest reaches is sort of eugenicist, um, can be both, can have a sort of like more woo and vitalist and a more kind of material, like hardcore materialist version. But then there's also, but then there's the, um, the, the desire for re-enchantment, which I think can be quite distinct. Um, and both of those, it seems like there's a lot of different ways to go wrong. There's not just like one way to screw up. There's a lot of different ways that, you know, you might get seduced into taking an approach to your own life or an approach to the world that is ultimately opens you up to spiritual and material badness. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I would, I would rather not have either of those. <laughs> That's the correct answer to pass the test. Um, so yeah, I think I, I too, uh, in true Episcopalian fashion, will take a middle of the road uh, answer. Um, but I, I, I think that the things that are important for the kind of political community that I would want to be a part of, which is also, I think, a moral and an intellectual community, are um, 
moral realism tied to humanistic uh, humility. Um, and I think that that is something that um, can come from and in either world uh, that you describe. And I, I really like, uh, Suzanne, I really appreciated your framing because I think, I think the thing that worries me most uh, is not necessarily, uh, and uh, but to say not the demonic, uh, but then I realized that I know, I, I mean, one should be worried about such things. Uh, not necessarily the specifics of um, a particular practice, so much as the standpoint that, um, as as uh, you just said, that 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 the that our own personal wills, what we want individually, uh, is constitutive of who we are. Which is not to say that our desires cannot point us towards the good or help us understand or discern. Um, you know, our our what we want is is part of I think the process of reasoning. Uh, what what is what is good and what is true? It is it is it is helpful. But I think that I I see uh, perhaps in both the uh, quote unquote materialist and the quote unquote pagan worldviews. I see them both of them as really downstream of this fundamentally modern uh, divinization of desire of individual desire and a sense that who we quote unquote really are is or authentically are to use uh, Charles Taylor's term is bound up with that. And I, I think that a community, uh, any kind of political community that puts appropriate limits, again, Episcopalian moderation here, appropriate limits on the self uh, is one that I that can allow for the kind of communal flourishing that I would want to see. So they're both bad, yeah. Yeah. Monsignor, what's your sense of the internet as a spiritual terrain? Yeah, well, there you go. Well, I use the internet for, for praying over people, and uh, we have a website, by the way, <laughs> catholicexorcism.org, of course it is. So, uh, catholicexorcism.com so oh, yeah. is a, uh, or, is a chicken franchise, that, oh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. fast food that they got in first. So, yeah, really. And, uh, actually I said, uh, we've gone completely viral. I mean, it's, uh, every time I do a short post on Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever, I get a hundred thousand views. So yeah, it's amazing. You know, I mean, we don't advertise and so we get people around the world. So we've had over 7 million views. And, uh, and in about eight months. But you think that's a lot. I thought I was pretty feeling very chuffed, as the Irish would say. I was feeling pretty proud of myself. And then I found out that Witch Talk, you ever heard of Witch Talk? It's a subset of Witch TikTok, you know? I thought that was a board game. I found out it was a media site. Anyway, so uh, Witch Talk, they had over 7 billion views. So somebody, somebody said, you know, it's like, all the people are calling us and want exorcism stuff. It's kind of like I got this small bottle of holy water. And I got all these people coming at me like, I need more holy water. Uh, so I would say, but getting back to the other question you talked, I was interested in what they were saying. And we have this little joke among exorcists. When, when we train new exorcists, and when one of the guys is being sent by his bishop and we start to train him, we say, we say look, you can take the blue pill or the red pill. From the Matrix, right? But I want you to know, you swallow the red pill, you can't go back. Remember Constantine, when he told the, the young woman, he said, you, you, you start seeing demons, you know, you, and you can't go back. And so when, when you move into our world, you don't go back. If somebody says, you don't go back to, you know, the daily wolf and wolf about parish ministry, you, 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 you've, you've, you've gone into the, a new world, you've taken the red pill, and and you begin to, and then what you watch and are a part of is this dynamic spiritual battle, and we're trying to rescue people who are desperate, and we've seen some and all of them except for maybe one or two have been rescued, if you will, by Jesus, and uh, it's kind of exciting and, but also it it sort of rips the veil off life. What is life? Life's a spiritual battle between good and evil. And uh, which side do you want to be on? I I I, uh, I like this one. I love near death experiences, but I'm a, I'm also a licensed psychologist, by the way. We love that psychological stuff. So this guy dies. He said he said he met Jesus, and Jesus said to him, 
you want to live with me or do you want to live with the demons? I want you to know it's not much of a choice. You know, I was thinking about, we talk about Satanism. I could see my, my, my sainted mother going, what could be wrong with worshiping Satan? Yeah, I could think a lot of things that could go wrong with that. You know, so uh, if when you've got that perspective of life, and when you do that every day, which we do it every day, what life means changes for you. And actually what it means is what the gospel says it means. If you actually, that's what the Jesus said to me. By the way, people, people, when you first asked me to do this, you, you talked about weird religions. I'm going, we're weird? <laughs> I didn't know I was weird. I mean, Jesus did three basic things. What did he do? He preached the kingdom, he healed people, and he cast out demons. How did I get to be weird? Jesus did this. You know, I mean, Jesus was weird. This makes us leave your spiritual speechless. Yes, yeah, it does. That, that, the, 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 yeah. the, but there's this, I mean, so what, what do you, so you've taken, you've taken the red pill, right. right? So everything is, there's a clarity to sort of spiritual conflict, right? But there's heaven but, and hell. Right. But the zone, there's clearly a zone of spiritual experience that yep. people have. That mo I think more people are probably having now than at any point in like the last 50 years of American history, right? That yeah. comes out of everything from meditation to psychedelics, you know, um, what, what that, is, was, yeah. but that is sort of yeah. by its like, like a, a sort of characteristic mystical experience that people have is, let's say, a sense of dissolving boundaries and oneness with the universe that has a sort of impersonal dimension, right? That that seems to be a sort of like a kind of baseline sort of mystical experience that people have who are religious and people have who are not, and it can change their life and make them more religious, but or not, right? But people having that kind of experience, if that for a lot of people is sort of a gateway into weird spiritual territory, that doesn't feel like a stark, moral choice, as far as I can tell. Like when I read about, you know, Sam Harris, who I, I mentioned probably in my list of new atheists, right, has gone from being a new atheist, uh, he's still an atheist, but he has a whole sort of, you know, a, pra a sort of spiritual practice, right, that's supposed to be spirituality for people who don't believe in God or the devil, right, but it's, you know, and it, it sort of connects to this kind of therapeutic religion is for the self. But that, that experience it's just not experienced as, you know, are you with Jesus or are you with the demons? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious what you make of that. Like if someone came to you and said, you know, Father, my spiritual life consists of the pursuit of those kind of mystical experiences. What is your, what's your... I have people coming up every day and uh, sending me emails or phone calls or whatever saying, I've oh, had these spiritual experiences and what do you think? And uh, well, they're, all, they're doing it all the time. I mean, uh, a couple today. And, it's, and uh, uh, I mean, traditional discernment, you, if you fall into three categories, you, it's either from God, from, from Satan, or it's from your own psychological stuff. Uh, now, I do believe, and I think that's maybe what you were talking about, Darrow, said that, that we do all have this spiritual hunger. So when you throw out Christianity, you're going to be looking for something. You're, you, that's why they're, 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 they're still looking. They're not going to say it. they don't like the whole Dawkins thing where there's nothing, you know. Uh, so they're looking and they're searching. Uh, and I think people do have real uh, natural experiences and quasi-supernatural experiences that can lead us into a deeper communion with the Lord. People sometimes often say to me, I don't go to church because I find God in nature. Actually, that's a good thing. I wish I went to church too. But still, finding God in nature is a good thing because God is in nature. He created it. So... If I go out into the woods and I feel this transcendent uh, a presence there, uh, you can go, most, you, today they might call it the force, you know? But, uh, or yeah, well, people do, you know? By the way, there's so many people come out. It's all just midichlorians, though. Yeah. They have distilled dive it's bloodstreams. So. I, I, I tell people, these things are movies. You know what I mean? They're movies. But everybody's, everybody's into the force. And what's the other one? Star Wars is the force, and Harry Potter is into whatever. I don't know. But they're all, they all, they all, I said, these are movies, you know, and, but uh, 
But people do, anyway, people do really have a spiritual experience, and that's when you need a spiritual director to kind of help you integrate these things and move into a deeper. What I try to tell these people in the witchcraft is, I look, what you're looking for, you're not going to find there. You, you, you go down that path, and all the witches I've talked to and worked with, it gets darker and uglier and, and angrier and more isolated. It gets bad. It's not going to give you what you want. There's, uh, and I, I am a Catholic priest. Hey, you, where are you going to find true joy and peace in your life? That my joy might be yours, your joy might be full, peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Jesus is going to give you that. And if you ever met a real holy Catholic person, there, was just, there must be a few around here, you can tell they radiate God's love, God's joy, God's peace. Ever met a real happy witch? I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe there's one. But you know, before I tell you, I'll, I'll shut up after I say this. My God, uh, most priests think their mothers were saints. Mine just happened to be one. And uh, so, so she, before my mother died, she, there were two experiences where she, her face just radiated this joy before she died. And then I knew she's definitely going to go to the kingdom. That's she, and would she do all those? I said, Mom, make sure you say some Hail Marys. She says, I'm constantly saying Hail So there you go. Now, is that, but is that something that Christians should think changes with Christianity itself? Like, is it possible to be, is it possible to be, Susanna, a happy pagan before Christ? Um, I mean, I think that, one of the things that irritates me occasionally about Nietzsche is, and, and about BAP is that it seems to me that they, neither of them take seriously the paganism that they claim to be embodying. Um, so if Nietzsche, obviously, his ideal human life is Achilles. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you live um, a short life, you die in your Aristia on the battlefield in glory. Your name is... Um, you know, sung by by um, by bards down through the ages. Achilles, you know, a, a couple, of, you know, in the next book, Odysseus goes to the sequel. The sequel, Iliad two. <laughs> yeah, Iliad two. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Odysseus goes in in book nine of the Odyssey to Hades, and he sees, and it kind of like works its way up. He sees um, his mother. And he sees uh, a bunch of the women who were the daughters of men, who slept with the sons of God, who gave birth to the giants, you know, and heroes. Um, and then he sees, I think it's Agamemnon. Then he finally sees Achilles, and Achilles is dead. And he said, and and you know, Odysseus is, is basically don't you know, don't don't worry about it. Every you are your your name is being sung by bards and and you rule down here over the dead. And I, I, um, Achilles says, I forget what the line is, but you, you guys probably know it. It's I would rather be a slave for a poor dirt farmer than rule down here over all these breathless dead. Um, the kind of Aristea, the kind of glory that I think our contemporary vitalists are looking for the kind of Zoe, the kind of life that they're looking for. The pagans wanted it too, and they didn't have it. Like that was the whole point. You didn't, and, and they weren't okay with not having it. They, they had a problem and they described that problem very well in their mythology, um, as well as in their philosophy. And the problem was what is the good and how do we have life? Um, I, I don't think the pagans were happy pagans. I think they were waiting pagans. And what they were waiting for happened. And we have that Zoe. We have that life. Um, so I, I don't think it's a good idea to go backwards because what are you going to do that for? I mean, do you, I guess then that leads to the question, if you try to go back, right, is it possible to take the sort of bricolage, the, you know, the sort of do-it-yourself, mix-and-match religion and turn it into a sort of coherent force. Because, right, I mean, it seems in, especially your description, Tara, it seems very scattered. Like, you can go down sort of specific roads and end up in specific very dark places, but we're not in a world where it's sort of adding up to, you know, Jeff Bezos sacrificing a bull on the steps of the Capitol, right, to, this is one of the, yeah, my, I used that image in a column, and I, 
I liked it maybe a little bit too much, right? But like, and and a sort of a formal a formalization, right? A sort of a sort of reformalization of of non-Christian, pre-Christian, post-Christian spirituality in a way seems very unlikely. And I'm both curious if you guys agree. Then to pivot to a last subject before we open it up for questions, like how does that interact with the kind of technological the, the the places where sort of the the supernatural and the material sort of interface, like artificial intelligence, for instance. Um, yeah, either either point, both points. Like, I'd be wary. I'd be wary of a kind of talking about modern paganism, if, uh, to use that term, as as something that is a revival of something pre-Christian. I think it's a distinctly modern phenomenon, a distinctly, particularly post-19th century phenomenon, perhaps even a post-Nietzschean phenomenon, if we're going to give him credit. I do I, I do think that there, we see, not just in Nietzsche, but throughout the 19th century, and, and Susanna, you brought up new thought, I, I, I do very much think that Nietzsche and two thought uh, are two sides of the same coin. I've argued that in my book as well. I think it's exactly this kind of distinctly post-Enlightenment desire to find in the realm of the the magical or the will or the sort of will-based self uh, a recovery of something that is not fully known. I think a lot of the, the, just as 19th century nationalism sort of fetishized imagined pasts of mountain villagers and what have you and, and, and certain kinds of folklore, so too, I think, do we see a particular desire to divinize something in a, in a new way that is much more individual than uh, perhaps pre, pre-Christian, to use that term, pre-Christian uh, senses of the self uh, might have allowed. Because so something you do find in, for example, you know, actual ancient Roman paganism, to use that again, and I'm not sure I feel about that term in that context, but you have a civic religion. The Roman gods are part of the Roman state. They're part of uh, the apparatus of community. And I think that that is something that we absolutely do not have in whatever word we want to use for our our religion of modernity, uh, where I think what we're actually seeing is a kind of obsession with uh, the power of the self over and against the horizon of death, um, where the fear of the fear of nothingness and the fear that if this is all there is, I must maximize my life in a certain way, perhaps for glory, perhaps for money, perhaps in the service of this imagined best self. But there is, I think, a fundamental nihilism to it, to the vitalist version and to the uh, life hacking, less explicitly spiritual, you know, get my steps in and then sleep X number of X number of hours a day and track it all on my iPhone version. Um, but all of them seem to be in the service of creating a life that can be considered holistically a good life, but where the sense of what that good life is, is neither communally focused, nor is it spiritually focused, is not focused on a higher good to which the self ought to be subservient, at least in the the kind of robust version of this I'm describing. But Susanna, isn't couldn't you argue that the digital realm <laughs> is itself an attempted creation of a sort of universal city mm-hmm. under the you know benevolent eye of a Jupiterian artificial intelligence? <laughs> I think you could argue that. Thank you. Good. Please do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so the the, the question that you're asking is probably something like, could there be a post-Christian civil religion that is um, shared and that is uh, sort of taps into the, the 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 numinous in a real and kind of scary way, but that kind of presents itself as materialist? And I think that if there was one, that's what it would have to be. It would have to be something that didn't really challenge our materialism fully that allowed us to pretend to still be materialists 
um, but that allowed us to have certain kinds of collective experiences and individual experiences that are in reality the like interaction with some kind of uh, small g gods or something. I don't know. You know, it it does. It seems to me that personally, if I were like a demon, I would think that it was a good idea. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you something. <laughs> I would think it would be a good idea to um, get people to interact with me on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe, you know, having a little sort of avatar that they carry, a little fetish that they carry around with them that feels very personal to them, um, that maybe on the back of it has a picture of an apple with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> you know, that was Paul Kingsnorth's ob observation, which totally freaked me out. Um, but yeah, I, like, and yet... Jeff, this is really creepy. Yeah, you're really excited. This is, which um, in kind of um, collective common good that is, uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> that is um, not necessarily linked to the good. Um, so I, I think we should be a little nervous and maybe think about cutting down on our Twitter time. I say that to myself, obviously, primarily. Uh, uh. You know, I, I listen to those, what you're talking about, Tara, whatever, and, and you can see people searching for something and using this, trying to use the will, and the, and the individual trying to, trying to get there. You're right, we got problems here with the sound. Uh, they do mess with these things. You need, you need to, to bless them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, but what I would say is I think what's going to happen is, and maybe it's a good thing, it was some point you keep trying, 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 trying to do all these things you're good doing, I think you're going to find at some point you're going to say, I can't do this by myself. I'm trying. I'm using my will. I'm doing all those things. And, I, and I'm trying. I'm trying. I, I, I can't quite get there. So the question is, you either give up, live for today, or say, maybe there is another way for me to get where I should be, my best self. And that's why we say what Jesus is the way. Jesus is that bridge, you see. The bridge that gets, he's the one that gets you to the divination. Talking about divination. And how do we really get the divination? The, the God man who, be, who, who is a, the bridge to that. So the real realization of the human person, as John Paul II said, was in Jesus because he's their bridge to divination. He's where we want to go. What the? Thank you. Why don't we take some questions? Um, since we have 30 minutes left, and we have two microphones, right, that will, oh well, if they're working or not. Um, and we haven't really touched on UFOs or DMT elves, so if anyone has specific questions about those topics, which I promise some of our panelists to bring up, please offer them. But, um, yeah, let's let's just start right here. Um, Psychedelic, maybe. Yeah, I want to build on just this historical theory that a lot of the Hellenist cult religions emerged as the Greek city-state collapsed, Stoicism emerged after the Roman Republic was gone. And so similarly, like how much are these occult or spiritualities emerging for the fact that all the energy on both the populace left and right 2016 onwards just became either online communities or astroturf. So like if we had mass trade unions, mass political organizations of like the 19th, 20th century, people would just not have the time to go down these mental rabbit holes. Uh, okay. Well, I, I guess my one thing would be, I'm not sure that it's historically totally spot on to say, like, for example, the Eleusinian mysteries were not, I mean, the cult of Mithras, yeah, the popularization of like Neoplatonism and some kinds of Stoicism, yeah, that was post- the fall of the Republic, but the Eleusinian mysteries were from way back. And so I, I do think it's, I it, like, you might argue that like, okay, if we had a more coherent Walter Cronkite, like public sphere, then we wouldn't be doing witch talk, which might be true. But I also think that, um, there is, you know, there's always, there's a hunger for, um, transcendence that's there no matter what. And, you know, Jack Parsons was doing Aleister Crowley stuff uh, you know, in the middle of Walter Cronkite, Cronkite world. You know, so I don't know. So 
I agree with you. <laughs> While also, um, but I do think that there is something to be said for, uh, and there's of course that the, the great T.S. Eliot quote about uh, the various uh, sortilage always happening when in, in various forms of turmoil from the shores of Asia to the Edgware Road. Um, but I think that there is something to moments of institutional mistrust lending themselves being fertile uh, ground for the inward turn. Because I think that, that, that it is a quite natural and understandable response to say, these things on which I build my moral or social architecture, be they religious, be they political, be they the journalistic establishment, the scientific establishment, what have you. Uh, if, they, if I can't trust these things, if they're lying to me, the natural response, I think, is to say, well, at least I know I'm not lying to me, that a kind of inward turn becomes a source of seeming authority. Now, I think that there's a, there's a really... Uh, long and rich uh, tradition of literature and wisdom uh, that's, that reveals that we do lie to ourselves all the time, constantly. Uh, we are not very reliable in that sense. Uh, but I think that they're in moments of particular kinds of cultural desperation. Um, and perhaps in this contemporary moment, uh, bolstered by cultural confidence in our own ability to apprehend ourselves. Uh, such that we are more likely to think of the self as reliable uh, and less likely to think of ourselves as self-deceiving, um, that dynamic becomes all the more fraught. I mean, there's, there's an interesting question there, too, just connected to the last 50 years of American history, because one thing I, on my list of things to ask that I didn't get to but will now shoehorn in, right, is the question of, you know, to some extent, some of these dynamics we're discussing are just a repetition of 1970s America, right? And to your point, this is, you know, a similar period of sort of deep disillusionment with institutional forms of authority, including with Walter Cronkite, right, himself. Um, and a, a sort of interesting, like, by the time when I was a teenager, my parents knew their astrological signs, but nobody in my high school graduating class of 1998 knew their astrological sign because that was like from the 70s, right? And super lame. And I think it's an interesting question, like what sort of, sort of, what sort of limited the, you know, repaganization of American culture that happened in the 70s? Was it this sort of, was it that? Christianity then was more resilient and was able to sort of reconstitute itself more effectively? Was it that institutional authorities in the 1980s and 1990s recovered some prestige and influence and made this kind of, you know, made sort of new age spirituality seem more unfashionable? I, I don't know, but it raises interesting questions for, let's say, the late 2020s and 2030s in terms of like what political and social shifts could sort of shift the religious dynamics back. And of course, the 70s were also a high tide for fascinations with exorcism. Um, anyway, let's take one from over here. Uh, yes. Right. Hi. Um, so the witch talk and the divine feminine influencers um, and all of this content is really consumed a lot by young women, teenagers. I'm 25, people my age and younger. Um, I'm wondering, I went to a Catholic college. We had yoga on campus. We had a transgender clothes closet, you know, not the best faith formation and communicating our values. I'm wondering what other colleges and high schools could do to better insulate young women from these between silly and dangerous temptations of like the secularism occult and femininity influencers. Well, I think one thing is to teach and that's I'm trying to do that. But I spoke to the bishops conference. And I said, you know, You've got to get out there and start talking about this. There's a lot of people out there who say, I'm a Catholic and I'm also doing witchcraft, and I'm, but I'm a good witch. You know? Uh, they, no, you're just a witch. Yeah, and, but they don't realize that my, my intention is good. See, that's the purest subjectivity. If my intention is good, it's fine. A lot of people were praying over whose intentions were good, but the, it didn't turn out too good. So I think that teaching, so we, parents, teaching young people and for just to to add to that question too it's to 
to make it a question about men too, right? Because there is there is this sort of polarization, and you sort of gestured at this a little bit with the sort of witch talk on the one hand, Nietzschean vitalism on the other hand, right? Like, I don't even have a question. I just wanted to throw the, the, I, throw so, the men into the equation too, right? Although I, I do want to raise one point about talking about witchcraft and young women, which is um, I think it's important to contextualize the rise in interest in the divine feminine and in witchcraft more broadly as particularly a post-2016 political phenomenon, which is to say uh, many of the people that got uh, interested in resistance witchery uh, were doing so from a place of palpable anger at what they saw as, um, in the wake of Donald Trump's election, what they understood as uh, a moment of, and, in, in, you know, to use the language that, that some of them would have used, you know, white supremacy and patriarchy and the victory of certain kinds of uh, political ideology and ugliness. And whatever you make of uh, that account, to whatever one's response is to that, that narrative, I think it's um, important to recognize that there is a, a real need and was a sense of fear on the part of young women that uh, whatever was happening on the wider political sphere would be um, would have a political component that was dangerous for them. That was that was sort of the narrative that was that 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 is how that many of them would characterize their understanding of the situation. And so I think that um, it's difficult to talk about modern witchcraft without understanding it as a reaction to a very specific cultural moment. I mean, I that might be true. I, I, I was sort of going to go in a different direction, although I actually think I might agree with you more. But I'm going to say what I was going to say anyway, because I think it might also be helpful. I don't know. So I went before I was Christian, I went through a kind of like feminist witchcraft phase when I was like 15 or so. And what I was really into was just sort of like this idea of embodiment. Like there is a real difference between men and women. What does it mean that I'm a woman, a woman and there are men? And, you know, woman, I was 15. Um, and there's this kind of like Starhawk and then Iron John, like sort of batch of books that were like popular then, which were kind of like discussions of like what it means to be archetypally a woman and archetypally a man. And... I think that Christianity, like our our sort of understanding of the world, um, can give that back to us and can give give that to us in a way that's richer and truer. Um, you know, when when you get married, you are kind of like re -embody You are re embodying the kind of you're embodying the the union between Christ and the church. Like you're living out a you're living out an archetypal sort of self as a man and as a woman, and helping people understand that like what what your life is in the world whether you're um married or whether you're whether you're celibate like your sexuality has to do with um living out a kind of archetypal uh holy and powerful way of being in the world i think that could help the cheesy version of this is like trad wives um but i don't think it has to be cheesy i think it can be good I've been uh, quoting my mother. I'll do it again. Uh, she, uh, very bright. She's the brightest person in the family. And she uh, went back to college in her 50s and got a college, got a college degree. She'd never had one before. And uh, she joined this group called uh, College Graduate Women, what I was called. But she was very, very smart. And, and one time she said to me, she looked at me, and I was, I was probably in my early 20s. She said, you know, just offhand, she said, it's a man's world. And I've never forgotten that comment my mother made to me. I, and I started to realize that, you know, that there is a real reason for, as you say, people searching for the divine feminine and their witchcraft and all that kind of stuff. And my mother just basically told it to me, and very simply, that it's a man's world. And that's, and that's a problem. And so I think we'll probably never get to the roots of stamping out witchcraft until we we start to recognize the, the reality of, of, of women and men as equal partners. And that that's, and until we get there is it's going to be a problem. 
Um, let's go, sir. <clears throat> Thank you guys for this talk. Um, I'm just curious about, we talked a little bit about technology. Um, my question's kind of around the sort of ethic of technology, the rationale of technology, thinking specifically of um, Lewis's comments on the abolition of man, he makes this distinction. He's comparing science, uh, magic, technology, and religion. He says a superficial connection, uh, a superficial pairing of those would be science and technology, magic, and religion. Um, whereas like a, a more fundamental and deeper pairing would be uh, science and religion and magic and technology because science and religion are about um, trying to understand the world, whereas magic and technology are about manipulation. Um, and I'm just wondering, with um, the sort of increased sophistication of technology, with this world that we're living where everything is endlessly manipulable, if that sort of attitude and the ethic of technology has perhaps played into this uh, sort of desire to manipulate through magic, through witchcraft, et cetera. So, so one of technology, magic, witchcraft, who can say? No, I got it right. I, got, I actually went to I had, the, I had it sound off. Um, human error. Um, I think that one of the, the really interesting connections between when I'm talking about magic now, I'll talk, I'm talking about sort of post-early modern mad European magic is the degree to which, particularly 19th century onwards, uh, people like Crowley, et cetera, um, the, degre the degree to which the fundamental principles of magic start to become about the shifting of human perception where what the thing that magic can do is, is sort of like the field on which magic operates is what human beings believe. And if you can make people believe certain things, then reality is downstream of that. And I think that that, that idea that reality is malleable precisely because where reality happens is in perception is something that is sort of already there in the magical literature, so to speak, but it becomes so important in the digital age precisely because we live in a reality that is uh, very malleable in terms of what we are seeing on our computer screens, but also in terms of the way that discursive narratives do feed back into the, the material world in terms of how human culture works is that if a meme takes hold, if disinformation takes hold, if an idea takes hold, that does reverberate. And so I think that there is sort of one element of the question of magic and technology is the question of technology that can be, can shape human perception. I think it's a second and related question that is sort of perhaps less clear is the point at which, you know, I'm not a Luddite. I don't think all technology is bad. And I don't think that, you know, any, any technology is, is, is somehow um, subverting the, the divine plan in, in givenness. But there is, a, there is something, I think, that is, that is deeply true and, and, and beautiful about human existence, that we're always kind of caught between facticity and givenness and human creative power and what we can do. And yet when technology kind of supercharges itself such that things can be done so so easily and so quickly that they do not take the kind of time and attention and moments of our lives against the horizon of our inevitable death, uh, things do take on different meaning and significance. Uh, I think about this every time I write a handwritten letter versus you know type out a tweet. And it, it's not just that we call them zeets. Oh now. no, so we do. Um, um, there is there is something You're about um, the way that we direct our attention in a finite life as acts of reverence, of acts of worship, as acts of love in what we do, and when the cost of action goes down, um, 
some of that is lost. And I think I, I have strong reservations about limitlessness and its relationship to the human person, um, the mortal human person. But I wonder if, if you could also argue a little bit that some of the sort of magical turn, right, reflects a disappointment with recent products of science and, and technology both, right? That I And I, I completely agree with the sort of demonic analysis of, of the internet. I was hoping when I asked you about this that you just say it's demons all the way down or something, and then I would finally have the courage to throw my iPhone away. But, um, but, but there's also a sense, like, if you read, you know, if you look at sort of what people are looking for from artificial intelligence, for instance, right? It's like, well, artificial intelligence is going to be able to figure out, you know, cures for cancer that we, that our current science isn't able to figure out. And it's going to have, it's going to, it's going to have this kind of breakthrough that, you know, you would expect from, um, you know, a 16th century magus summoning, summoning a demon of the upper air, right, to, to, to help, to help him figure out how to turn lead into gold, right? And similarly, something that's sort of fascinating in the literature of, of UFOs, right, is, you know, one of the recurring ideas among people who think that the U.S. government has extraterrestrial or whatever technology, right, is that the aliens have the fix for global, global warming, for climate change, that they have the alternative energy source that we haven't been able to figure out, and yet somehow our government, for whatever malign reasons, is covering it up. So I think there's a, a sort of sub-theme in that kind of discourse where it's like we need, you know, we need magic, quasi-magic, to deliver the things that our science isn't delivering us, that we need to survive as a species, to, to survive climate change, to survive cancer. And maybe it then loops back to this, you know, sort of immortal longings. But I think that's in there, too. Um, all right, so over here. Yes, in the back. Uh, I'm not surprised by the uh, difficulties with the microphones tonight. The great technology theorist Marshall McLuhan once said, uh, the prince of the power of the air is a wonderful electrical engineer. Um, so I want to actually extend the question, the, the line of thought we just had. Um, you know, we know from Paul, right, that um, I, I, worship of idols doesn't effectuate some kind of magical or metaphysical transformation of meat or wood or metal. And yet there does seem to be this recurring human desire to worship some artifact in order to get a kind of word from the outside. And throughout history, it seems like the things speak in a sense, whether, so I wondered whether you, and, and now I, I guess my, my concern to get to the point is uh, we have this technology which does seem to offer us alien intelligence. And so I wondered if you could if you could speak to the connection between idolatry and this desire for worship and this desire for oracular knowledge and um, and the supernatural. Well, I, th I think that as you're implying again, Tara, that we all have this spiritual side to us that is uh, thirsting, you know, for that. And, and I think all the priests should realize this, you know, people want an experience of the divine. I mean, they, 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 they're longing for that. And when the masses are boring or whatever, that's what I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's not helping. Uh, so, but they did a survey of people in the pews, Catholic pews, and found out that 60% of them said they've had some real spiritual experience in, in their lives. And when I work with seminarians here at Catholic University, I'll say, how many of you had a significant experience of God in your life that resulted in you becoming a priest? Yeah, three quarters of guys raised their hands. The other quarter are probably not lying, but whatever. But so there, there, there is this hunger. That's what we really want. I mean, you can do all the, all the throw all the holy water you want, but people want to experience the divine in their lives. And the question is, how are we going to get it? And, and that's where we would differ with the whole magic thing. We would say that, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to surrender. You have to open yourself and trust that at some point uh, the Lord will hear you. And, um, 
and and they do. I mean, it, it actually, as a priest, you you get people tell you secrets about their lives. A lot of people have had some powerful experiences of God, especially if you are young people. By the way, you look at the young people working in the uh, these uh, youth ministries and campuses. It's striking how many of them have had very powerful spiritual experiences. So it's there. People need it. They want it, but. Don't look in the wrong place. You, you can't make it happen. That's one of the first things you learn in the spiritual life. You can't make it happen. You can meditate all you want, but God's going to do it in his time, not yours. But Susanna, what if chat GPT says <laughs> that it's right there? Yeah, I mean, so the people that I'm sort of thinking of most, who are, who are the most straightforward answer to the kind of question that you propose, John, is... Um, there, there's a couple called Simone and Malcolm Collins, and they're, they're together on Twitter, at like Simone H. Collins, I think. They're rationalists. They're Silicon Valley people who they're now kind of moved back east. Um, they've made an enormous amount of money, and they're now kind of in this post-rationalist mode of, of life. They're also incredibly pro-natalist, which makes them very appealing in a lot of ways, and they're kind of like linked to broader pro-natalist worlds However, their pronatalism involves like making a lot of embryos and then doing like extensive genetic selection based for not just, you know, getting rid of the kids with Down syndrome, but like getting rid of the kids who don't have the right personalities. Like they're very they're attempting to do this anyway. Um, they have created a religion and they actually have this book that they've written, which I read all of. It's like 800 pages long. I guess I didn't read all of it. I I read like 600 pages of it, I think. And I didn't read it. I listened to it, I should say. Anyway, it's called The Pragmatist's Guide to Crafting Religion. And the religion that they've crafted is something that they call descendant worship. They worship their own descendants, but they worship their own descendants, which they think will either merge with AI or will be good servants of AI. So they're, they think that like the humans who will thrive in the future, and they want their family to thrive as much as possible, um, will be the ones that AI finds useful. So um, their whole project is figuring out how to convince the incipient AI, which is about to emerge, they think, that their particular family is going to be really good servants of that AI. And I think there's going to so be... So this is Rocco's Basilisk, this but like, like a plan. Yeah, this is Rocco's Basilisk. For those, for, those, for those of you who don't know, Rocco's Basilisk right, is this thought experiment about a future hostile to humanity AI basically figures out how to punish people, right, who yeah. who impede, right, you're not supposed to yeah. talk about Rocco's Basilisk because it will, Get from the future, you. punish you for eating the emergence. This. <laughs> but yeah, Rocco's Bassinet. <laughs> Rocco's Bassinet is what Tara just said, which is extreme pronatalist. So like <laughs> singular. He has his so. father's eyes. Oh. <laughs> wow. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the maximum version, and I think there probably are going to be like some more minimal versions of this, like people having a sense that like, you know, the the AI is what cares about me, or is what I can look to, or is what I we are we need to worship. We we knew we do even these like totally rationalist, you know, this couple absolutely need, felt the need to make a religion and they made it they didn't seek it out they didn't like look for it they made it and i think that the posture of poesis when you're talking about god is a real bad one the posture of poesis when you're like making a poem is great but you know when you're talking about god you got to be looking you can't be making um so that's kind of how i think about it um so Is it one more master or yeah, one or two? Uh, thank you very much. What I perceive as a, a common thread through everything you've said is that there seems to be a desire for enchantment or transcendence without obedience. And I say this from the perspective I'm a Benedictine oblate, which means I'm a lay person. I'm affiliated with a monastic community, and I live the rule of Saint Benedict according to my state in life as a as a layman. And um, 
some years ago when there started to be a talk of a, a Benedictine option in the political sphere, the thing that struck me was uh, there's been one since the fifth century, which was to live the, the Benedictine rule. And it struck me that this, like these sorts of discussions of Christianity, Christian communities kind of separating themselves from the world is maybe part of this seeking the, the transcendence without obedience. How do we, um, how do we make obedience appealing to, to a world that's seeking the transcendence and trying to kind of do it on its own terms? Well, I think one commonality, if you could say, between uh, uh, maybe uh, some of the occult and our own spiritual tradition is that, you know, discipline, fasting, prayer, meditation, all those things, reading sacred text, all those things open oneself up to this divine, this experience, whatever. But the difference would be, we would say it when you're, you're a Benedictine Ablai, you, know, you, 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 you do your prayers and you do your meditation. But it opens you up to it, but, but it does not force it. It simply makes you more receptive, and which is why you want to retreat, for example. You know, if, 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 if may God can touch you in the middle of Times Square, but or probably my, it might. Uh, but, you know, when you want to retreat every year, you know, you, 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 you open yourself up to it. So the discipline... Like, for example, my, I've got a relative who's big into yoga and all that stuff, and she says, well, I'm not into all that Catholic fasting and stuff and discipline. I said, yeah, you are. You do more fasting than I do. You more discipline than I do. You want these yoga retreats, and you're killing yourself. We Catholics would never do that. It's too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, uh, the amount of fasting we do is nothing compared to what these yoga people are doing. They're living on uh, lettuce leaves and water, and they're, and they're, you know, chanting these things. We had one woman who, who converted. She's from Tibetan Buddhism. It was, she used to, for her, it was totally demonic, but but she she was Catholic before she retreated. She they did hundreds of thousands of these genuflections to the point every day where it hurt her knees and stuff. And I was going, really, we never do that. So uh, so the the difference is is yeah, we do those things, but we open ourselves up in that way to a divine presence. Why don't we do one more question from each side of the room? And then each of the panelists can respond to both questions, one question, you know, a question of your own invention, an AI generated question. Anyway, so we'll take one uh, from this side, sir. Can we bring the mic and then one from over here. Thank you. My colleague John touched about this on a higher level, but I just wanted your all's perspective on how improvements in the AI technology just make this sort of paganization more common because people starting to use ChatGPT and those tools as sort of a divine oracle that it came from GPT, therefore it's the correct answer, and whether that will just lead to people going down roads they shouldn't be going down. Um, and then over here, yes, sir, in the middle. Do you think UFOs are mostly demonic deceptions, hallucinations, advanced human technologies, or truly visitors from another planet? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 So we're we're get, we're ending we're ending with AI and UFOs. Go. Um, I think uh, actually Ross and I did a podcast about this um, probably two three years ago pre pandemic. I think that there, the phenomenon is the same phenomenon as fairy sort of abductions, but translated into a materialist worldview, again, so that we don't get knocked off our materialist high horse. Um, probably. I think that's probably what it is. I also think it's very weird that, again, this is kind of part of the deep 20th century weird history, um, the number of UFO sightings really took off like the first UFO like classic UFO sighting um and then a lot of subsequent ones took off right after um the first rocket was uh shot off at was it 
where was it? It was it was the it was the jet propulsion lab the, the jet propulsion laboratory, um, by this guy called Jack Parsons who was a, a Crowleyite sort of magus. Um, so basically, this Crowleyite magus shoots a rocket piercing the sublunary sphere, and then we get all these visitors. Um, I don't think that's coincidence. So that's what I think. It's one of the, it's like I think there's two things going on. Personally. Um. I have no uh, informed opinion about UFOs, uh, although I am very creeped out right now uh, learning this. Um, so I will answer the AI question, uh, although uh, after hearing about this uh, descendant worship, which I know a bit about but not fully, I'm also creeped out by that. Um, I think if we are to talk about a meta-narrative of mo for the religion of modernity, Perhaps, which perhaps is a is a fool's errand. Perhaps I'm I'm looking uh, to make connections where there are none. But um, I think that if there is a single trend in our religious shift towards the not just the worship of the self, but the self transcending self, the self that becomes a god, the idea that this could be codified. Um, the way and the way in which it would be codified would be through artificial intelligence um, makes me think that uh, the kind of the internet world where we're all looking looking for the uh, hoping to present ourselves in the best possible way while participating in our own self actualization through this giant machine, which then is uh, being sort of used to train a artificial human that is uh, somehow the culmination of our open uh, desires, but also uh, m m an improvement upon us. I have to say, if I if you were to ask me to like reverse engineer uh, the re something very, very frightening, uh, I w it doesn't sound great when you say it out loud, is all I'll say. Uh, they're quoting my mother tonight. We, uh, she, uh, she actually believed in aliens, and I, I don't, but I, I respected her for that. But who knows? Uh, I want to give you a couple of stories. One is, uh, I was working with a, I don't know if I told you that, I was working with a family, and uh, at one point, it's at dusk, the, the young boy comes running out of the basement and said, Mommy, Mommy, there's a big man in there, a big, a big ugly man with no face. The daughter takes a picture. I've got the picture. And in the picture, you see this seven-foot humanoid figure with no face. And you looked at it and you said, ooh, that's a demon. And it certainly was. Uh, so it, 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 it kind of struck you. I mean, you kind of go, yeah, I mean, what can you say? It, it, it was. So uh, it's strange. No, strange things do happen. Uh, but in terms of... What you're saying about the, because some of these UFOs be uh, uh, demons, actually, it's not uncommon that with a, a huge infestation, you'll see these globes of light around the room. And uh, we've got a bunch of, I got some videos of those too, of globes, uh, chairs moving on their own, globes of light going on, whatever, you know. And uh, so, yeah, we, there's some of that. But uh, my response is this I've had exorcists tell me, oh, I think this person's possessed by a, an alien. I said, nonsense. I said, if aliens exist, they are mortal in some way, they're material in some way, they, they, they can't infest a human being. Only spiritual demons can do that. Besides, demons don't share. They're not going to share spaces with, with, with some other. But as John Paul II said, there might be uh, aliens, but they're, they'll, if they are, we'll preach them about Jesus. You know, yeah, So, yeah, it could be, but we'll talk to them about Jesus. Um, that was a terrific place to end, but I'm still going to give myself the last word because I just, I'm in charge. I'm taking, I'm taking moderator's privilege. Um, and I, I think that chat GPT and AI are on the one hand, from the point of view of like how far artificial intelligence has come incredibly impressive and the acceleration is remarkable, and we could be having a very different conversation about this four or five years hence. Right now, though, ChatGPT does not feel like an oracle. 
You don't go to ChatGPT and get some amazing synth synthesis you've never encountered before. You get, at best, a sort of pretty smart version of conventional wisdom, at worst, something that's riddled with errors. What you're looking, the oracle, would be something that takes a question like, what the heck is going on with UFOs, where you have the intersection of, as Susanna says, sort of stuff that bears resemblance to like fairy abduction stories from the Middle Ages, but stuff, on the other hand, where you have, you know, fighter pilots observing things and people, there are certainly people in the Pentagon who believe in aliens. Whether or not they are real, that is still a really weird fact about American life right now. So you have basically a mixture of information, sort of interesting pieces of information that just don't seem to add up to a coherent whole. And you have a technology that claims to be able to, you know, deliver oracular answers. So the moment when ChatGPT explains what's actually going on with aliens will both be a great relief to those of us who want to know what's going on with UFOs and also a signal that the apocalypse is at hand. So on that note, chosen by myself, I'd like you all to thank our panel for a most entertaining evening.